This is Breakpoint This Week, a weekly briefing on faith, culture, worldview, and mission with John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Well, welcome to Breakpoint This Week. Got a lot of stories to talk about, uh, but I am without my cohort, Warren Smith. We're in Washington, D.C. for the Wilberforce Weekend, uh, actually recording this here Friday morning. Uh, the last night had a wonderful event at the Museum of the Bible uh, with John Lennox and Eric Metaxas, but sitting in to talk about the stories of this week from a Christian worldview, uh, my friend Trevin Wax, whom uh, if you know Trevin from his articles, you know Trevin hopefully from Twitter, we should follow him on Twitter, he posts a lot of important things, oftentimes jumps in on the world and everything in it, uh, our podcast from our friends at World Magazine. Trevin, thanks for jumping in today. Thanks for having me, John. Glad to be here. Got a lot of stories to talk about. I was like full. We didn't have any. We're not going to have any trouble. I don't think filling out this half hour. Yeah, uh, that's right. First, yeah. I mean, listen. First, let's start with. Uh, we've been saying a lot on Breakpoint that the pro life movement has moved to the states. The really the battle over life. You got both sides really doubling down. Pro life states doubling down. Pro abortion states doubling down. There's a feeling that Roe v. Wade is vulnerable, and if it is vulnerable. Uh, it's probably going to go back to the states. Uh, Alabama, though, uh, this week passed a law, uh, sparked all kinds of outrage. This is a full frontal assault on Roe v. Wade. This was basically a ban on abortion uh, at any stage, including rape and incest. It was really something. Yeah, and it looks like, I mean, we're, we're seeing something of a wave build among um, a lot of these, these states uh, that are you know, the strategy for a long time was we need to chip away at Roe, right? That that's that's been the strategy, get you know, chip away at Roe v. Wade to the Supreme Court. But I think there there's a feeling of exhilaration among a lot of pro life people who for decades now have been working toward protecting the life of of, of the most vulnerable. Um I, I think I think we're in a moment where we realize Roe v. Wade is potentially more vulnerable than it ever has been. And so there's this this desire to push legislation through that is going to directly challenge. Uh, David French said it's throwing down the gauntlet uh, uh, at Roe v. Wade. And, and whether or not that's the best strategy, I mean, that's a lot of pro-lifers debate and discuss uh, if, if this is the best way forward. But it's it's hard not to admire the, the passion and courage of of the legislators that are doing this. Yeah, and Governor Kay Ivey signed it almost right away. I mean, that was interesting as well. I think your point is an important one, which is there's been kind of the strategy of incrementalism, right? Let's 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 get any win that we can. Let's get an abortion restriction here, an ultrasound mandate here, a parental notification there, uh, and even what we have with the so-called heartbeat uh, bills. Uh, six weeks, um, anything, once the heartbeat is detectable, or as a New York Times article, Trevor, I don't know if you saw that this week, trying yeah. to comment on this, I think it called it a, what 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 measures call a fetal heartbeat? I'm like, that, that's what, it was in scare quotes too in the New York Times. Did you see that piece? It yes, was yes, I did. Oh, I, think it, I think it said what doctors call a fetal heartbeat. And I think, it, <laughs> I think if, it's if, what if everybody a, on the planet calls yeah, a fetal if a, heartbeat. If a this doctor isn't up in calls it, yeah, I just, it, it's, it's, the the uh, the bias in the media on some of these issues and and I, I know we could talk about uh, we need to talk about the, the what just happened in Alabama and what may be about to happen in Missouri but the 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 bias and the difference of coverage of this you know the extreme bills in Alabama or Georgia or Missouri versus what the the, the lack of coverage we saw in New York. Uh, with, right. And you want to talk about an extreme pro-abortion bill? I mean, there you've got a state that's gone all out, uh, um, I- I- extreme. And, and I, I just the, the the media double standard here is breathtaking to behold sometimes. It, it, oh, it really is. That was it was actually a, it, what was stunning about it too. It was actually a pretty I thought thoughtful article talking about. You know, hey, this is probably what the Supreme Court is going to decide to do, uh, which we've said as well, which is the Supreme Court is not going to probably uh, do a kind of a, a, a sweeping reversal of, of Roe. Uh, like Roe was in terms of kind of an all-out ban, but it is probably going to gut it and it's going to send it back to the states and and so on and so on. Uh, but let's get back to the to kind of the Alabama strategy because here's the difference: uh, most of these other bills have been incremental. Alabama was kind of a sweeping. Here's where we stand. I'm with you. I think you got to admire the courage of these legislators. I, I was stunned by the reaction 
of uh, some of uh, hi- historically pro-life folks. I mean, even Pat Robertson called it a bill that was too extreme. Now, Robertson's not known for having measured uh, uh, comments on his show, The 700 Club, very often, uh, or often known for not having measured. Let's put it that way. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't understand. Uh, I, I think we need at least a state, a bill, something like that, 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 that basically is willing to say, no, this is actually what we mean. It is wrong. And Alabama could pass it, and they did pass it. I, to me, this isn't a problem with the strategy. This is a, uh, a something that we should be high-fiving, like New York legislators were high-fiving that radical abortion bill. Well, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see this happen. I'm, I'm nervous about the, the future of Roe v. Wade because we, I mean, let, let's be honest, we've been let down a lot, um, a, a lot, not, not just in, in the legislature, um, but also um, in court decisions. And so um, I'm, I'm nervous about the assumption that uh, we, we're going to have a 5-4 majority that that um, um, guts Roe or, or does away with Roe. Um, so I get I get some of the nervousness on pro-life activists and strategists who are saying, you know, this we, this is this is um, such a challenge to Roe that those who those Supreme Court justices, I mean, we've seen John Roberts and others who who may not want to overturn the precedent completely. We may be actually pushing them the other way and and hurting ourselves in the long term. I think that's the argument. Um, but I, you know, I still I, I, I don't think I want to give, you know, the benefit of the doubt to, to pro-life um, activists and people that have been in this debate and conversation for a long time to say, um, you know, that we can have differences of opinion and different strategies as to the best way to go about this. But surely we should all want the the the, the final um, decision to look something like what Alabama did. Like we, we want we want states to be able to say this is an abortion free state. And I, ultimately, we want to change the hearts and minds of people in the country so that the entire country um, things d- no longer sees abortion as uh, something assumed, but a- as you've said, often something that is unthinkable. But um, uh, I-, I think we can agree on that, even if some uh, people that in the pro-life movement question certain tactics or strategies or certain bills as, um, as, as not being the best play right now. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I think we, we've got to hit it on every single level, and and that is the ultimate goal. Is that at some point we'll we'll think about um, uh, abortion like we think right now about slavery. That it's one of the great evils of history. That it doesn't belong anywhere in a civilized society, and it doesn't matter if it's legal or if it's illegal. It's not right, and we're not going to do it. And that's really where we have to get. To and we're not there. We're we're not even close to being there. Um, you know, at best, most Americans want kind of a moderate, middle of the road sort of approach. Uh, they don't like the extreme in New York. They don't like the extreme in Alabama. So there's a lot of convincing left to do. And one of the things we're trying to just tell people and convince people of is that, uh, you know, I, I I was speaking for a pro life group in our city just a couple weeks ago and. Uh, I'm an NBA. Uh, I've been watching uh, the NBA playoffs. I don't know if you saw the game in the first round where the Golden State Warriors came into halftown uh, uh, up by like 35. And of course, they're the favorites to win it all. Uh, they were supposed to sweep the series, and, and they were up by 35 and ended up losing. And it, this happens to teams, right? And it's well, not because I, they fall like apart. The- the Falcons and the Patriots um, a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. And it's not because, it's never because people just fall apart. It's because they just take their foot off the gas. Uh, things are coming too easy. Uh, the other team starts kind of creeping back. And, I, and I, man, I tell you what, if we think because there's a ma- so-called majority on the Supreme Court and we're sure about what they're going to do, if there's one thing you should not be is sure about what the Supreme Court is going to do, that's, that's one thing that we should learn from history. Uh, we can't take the foot off the gas. The, 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 the energy has to be brought up, especially at the state and local level, uh, to provide options for women who find themselves in these situations, who find uh, help for women uh, who are trying to deal with guilt of past abortion, and, and also these, these legislative victories state by state. Well, you're listening to Breakpoint this week. John Stone Street here along with my special guest host, Trevin Wax. We'll be right back. We invite you to visit Breakpoint.org. While you're at our website, be sure to browse our online Colson Center store of great books and other resources. And you can link up to our social media sites like Facebook and Twitter. Back. 
Back on Breakpoint this week, John Stone Street here, joined this week by Trevin Wax uh, to talk about the stories of the week uh, from a Christian worldview. Trevin, tell folks how they can find you on Twitter and uh, online and can find out what you're up to. I, I have a, a uh, bi-weekly column at the Gospel Coalition uh, that you could just find by going to trevinwax.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, twitter.com uh, slash trevinwax. Same for Facebook. I've got one of those unique names that I don't have to have a, 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 a number of uh, different things for people to find me. It's pretty easy. So. Yeah, that's right. That's that must, yeah. I, I got one of those as well. Although there is a uh, kind of a, a libertarian John Stone Street who spells his name without an H. Uh, and, really? Uh, yeah, he's co- a, a politically conservative, uh, kind of first and foremost on Twitter. And uh, sometimes I worry because he, he kind of he says things that let's just say about Democrats that I wouldn't say. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I'm conservative, but not that conservative. So here, afraid anyway, people might uh, confuse the two of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have the middle initial John B. Stone Street. But Trevin, you post great stuff on Twitter. I hate to recommend that people even go to Twitter, especially given the last couple of weeks that I've had on Twitter. But I would say that uh, you're a great a guy to follow on Twitter. A lot of interesting things. Uh, well, Trevin, that. let's go to the story. Interesting. Uh, Representative Brian Sims, a Democrat in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, filmed himself this week, basically kind of, kind of accosting, verbally attacking women who were just praying on the sidewalk outside of an abortion clinic. We've also had other assaults uh, take place in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, uh, Jan- uh, Janaya Gregory, a 31-year-old, uh, pled guilty to assaulting 82-year-old Donna Durning outside an abortion facility, threw to wow. her br- the ground. Donna ended up breaking her femur. Western Washington University vandals set fire to a pro-life uh, poster. Uh, a lot of times this has to do with Students for Life and Kristen Hawkins, which is, they're such a great group that have mobilized a younger generation to be pro-life. But um, the, the 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 issue with Representative Brian Sims in Philadelphia, I mean, you basically, this guy's kind of following these uh, folks around, including a couple teenage girls. Um, and, and here's what the mom of those two teenage girls wrote in USA Today. Sims not only aggressively, verbally accosted three minors, he attempted to dox them by offering a financial donation in exchange for their personal information. His actions were repre- reprehensible, entirely unbecoming of an adult male, let alone uh, an elected official. It sparked, by the way, a rally uh, last Friday uh, that, uh, man, um, uh, that that rally, I think the speakers, Abby Johnson was there, Lila Rose, uh, blogger Matt Walsh. Um, I think there were, I think, 10,000 people is what I heard that was at this rally in response to this. But well, well, first of all, what, did you did you watch the video with Brian Sims? What did you think? Oh yes, my my son and I. He's he's about to be fifteen. We were actually on our way somewhere, and I had my I handed him my phone. I said, "Watch this, watch this guy and what he does." And I I mean, he my 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 son was just appalled. Uh, I mean, he thought he actually thought that the protesters handled themselves so well um, mm-hmm. that it, it if there's any example of a of a media strategy backfiring, this this is one because I, no one can really defend um, what he was doing, and um, the, those that tried to defend that were watching live on you know the Periscope or whatnot are really the the kind of the craziest of the the crazies when it comes to activists for the you know for pro for the pro abortion movement. Um, I I I, th- I thought that it this was a moment where you saw clearly. Uh, a sort of an unhinged borderline rage toward anyone who would hold the pro-life position and it's it, it was stunning to see it in such you know just front and center like that now obviously you know we've got there are people on the pro-life side who are an embarrassment to the cause and so we always we want to, to to do the right thing where we want to lift up the best examples of our uh, intellectual opponents. But but w- when you put this in context of multiple attacks or assaults and things, you do see that there really is a a, a, a very uh, mass uh, uh, an underlying anger toward um, pro life people and people who are um, quietly witnessing to the uh, to the power of life. 
well, I want to get to something underneath all of this. And um, you're right. And, and Representative Sims did apologize. Uh, I think the damage sort done of. was, well, kind of. Um, yeah, fair, fair enough. Sort of apologized. Uh, uh, but I think the damage was done. And I think, um, you know, he'll see that kind of come back to bite him later on. But I, 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 I want to just point out something and talk about something because Alyssa Milano the actress uh, re- reacted this week in Georgia talking about hey women it's time to stand up for your rights and and um one of the ironies of the uh, of the representative Sims video is him talking about how women have this constitutional right and th- there's such a selective uh, elevation of women going on right now uh, I've got daughters trevin i know you you have a son you have daughter you have daughters too right that's right i have a daughter yes and and so 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 here's what i'm trying to get at um we are in this really strange age where some women are being elevated and rightly so where the violence against women is being highlighted and and rightly so uh where kind of past uh, evils perpetrated against women are being exposed uh, and, and 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 praise God that there's that that we're able to address some of these evils and so on, but we're still selectively leaving out some women, right? Um, women uh, like Abby Johnson, uh, you know, who are uh, you know used to run a Planned Parenthood now have changed their mind. Uh, they don't have they're not elevated they don't have the same sort of voice uh, that we're seeing those who you know right now in response to alabama story after story after story of, of folks who are kind of celebrating their abortions um in, in, when it comes to you know women in sports uh if if you're a woman who stands against a man who wants to compete in your sports you don't get a voice it just seems like a, it's a strange time. It's got to be a strange, you know, it's kind of, okay, it's a little strange that you and I are talking about this. We're two men. But at the same time, as the dads right. of daughters, the husbands of wives, it just seems like there's a, a, a crazy selectivity about which women we're allowed to elevate in this culture and which ones we're going to continue to silence and we're going to continue to intimidate. Well, I think this goes back to, to some extent to something we mentioned earlier, which is um, the... The, the, the institutions, the media institutions along the coasts um, have a very particular view of what constitutes what is good for women. And they see women who are opposed, the, the, the fact that, you know, roughly half of the country, uh, in fact, there are, I, I've seen polls and surveys, you know, you see different evidence here and there, but I've seen polls and surveys that show that women tend to be more pro-life than men, actually. Um, and so when you see stuff like that, the, the, that what 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 happens I think in some of these um, in the way that institutions and different um, media outlets lift up voices is they they tend to immediately assume uh, well people who don't agree with our vision of what flourishing means for women and what freedom means for women um, then that that's just because they have uh, been brainwashed or imbibed the 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 uh, the philosophy of the patriarchy or whatever it might be um, but but what you're finding here is that select that selectivity in who we in who vo- which voices get elevated is actually becoming um, apparent even in secular circles when you see for example um, many feminists at war with other feminists women who are uh, over particularly what 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 does being a woman mean? What is uh, with, with all of the debates over uh, transgenderism and the controversies around someone like uh, Camille Paglia or others? So you've got this this strange selectivity that even the coasts that are trying to control the narrative of this conversation can't quite uh, um, uh, only elevate the, the the voices that they want or suppress the kind of debate that they would rather not see. It, it's sort of bubbling up and, and surfacing all over the place, I think. Yeah, you know, uh, I think the tweet of the week was from Matt Walsh. I don't always follow Matt Walsh. I don't know. Do you know Matt? I don't know him. He's not somebody that I know. I know a lot of people uh, appreciate him, but I, I don't know him. I'm, I'm not too familiar with him. I've just, I see, he, he seems to be kind of a firebrand on Twitter, like, you know, throwing things out oh yeah you know just to get a reaction and kind of you know get people to respond 
And for the record, Trevin is not like that. He is a calm, <laughs> cool, collected guy. But but Matt did tweet this. I, I, I'm looking at it now. It had 45,000 likes. So anyway, not not that the number of likes and the number of retweets equals the value. But he, he did kind of speak to this kind of uh, inconsistency. Gender is a social con. He is what he wrote. Gender is a social construct. But I'm a woman. Hear me roar. But anyone can be a woman. But no uterus, no opinion. But trans women are women. But I demand women's rights. But men are women. But men are scum. But drag queens are beautiful. But appropriation is evil. <laughs> and you kind of put it all together. You're like, first of all, a high five for that one. I mean, it does kind of reflect the number of inconsistency and just crazy lack of logic that we have. In society, actually, we had uh, a Socrates in the city event to open up our Wilberforce weekend, which is happening this weekend in D.C. And John Lennox talked a lot about just kind of that lack of uh, logic. I think he was insulting Eric Metaxas when he said it, which was kind of funny. But he meant there's a kind of a larger kind of a lack of logic. Um, th- that that's the thing that kind of gets me. Um, you know, a, a buddy of mine at ADF uh, was banned from Twitter for posting uh, that it's unfair for men to win women's weightlifting uh, competitions. Um, I, I, it, it's just, it, I, I guess it is. It, it has something to do with the media voice, but it does, I think, deeply reflect the the, the implicit silence on this. There's just a, a lot of folks that are unwilling to speak up or to say, you know, this is a little crazy. Like, you know, wait a minute, is appropriate cultural appropriation okay or not okay? And then what's that have to do with, you know, transgender? I mean, there's just a lot of these questions that are going unanswered. Uh, in the name of, of kind of a, a I, I don't even know. I mean, it, it, it's you want to people call it a politically correct ideology or, you know, identity politics. There's lots of labels for it. But it, but it's it, at some level, it's just really a violation of absolute reality. I mean, it's just like we're, we're kind of looking at reality and saying, no, there, it's different than that. And that's yeah. never going to end well for a person or for a society. You know, moral moral revolutions are are always more powerful and more fragile than they seem, and sometimes the intensity with which the you know a, a moral revolution is the the fervency which with, with the fervor with with which people hold to that revolution is a sign of its inner fragility. Uh, you know, my my in laws uh, were you know spent most of their life in uh, communist Romania and had to to deal with you know the communist philosophy and communist history books and you know certain voices were banned or were marginalized certain artists or philosophers were basically only lifted up when whatever they were saying would help the regime and whatnot and everybody kind of knew a lot of this is illogical uh, the truth really isn't in play here and a lot of people just keep their head in that kind of regime they just would keep their heads down and they would kind of go along with the lie realizing but everybody knew this is a, a a sham, and the people you were really afraid of, you know, weren't just weren't your neighbors across the hall, unless you happen to know they were informers or something. But were generally the people that really did believe all of the the crazy lies that everybody in the society kind of knew were just out there. Um, but be, you know, in order to just get go along, people would just go along to get along. And I wonder if at some point, if if this sort of moral revolution were to get the kind of power that it is aspiring to get, if if we would ever be in a situation like that, where the, our, our society, everybody kind of knows, yeah, a, a boy can't really be a girl, a girl can't really be a boy, but I can't say anything about that because whatever. But the, the point, though, is that that ultimately is fragile. Truth wins. Nature strikes back. The real world is just, it's going to, it's going to come back to uh, um, to 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 take its stand, and so these revolutions that are built on falsehoods are ultimately more fragile than than they seem. Which is why you see some of this soft despotism uh, as, as part of the strategy of upholding it. Because if you don't have that, it's so obvious that it's not the truth. It 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 falls away. So some of these more invasive uh, uh, and controlling. Uh, attempts that we see from the part of people who are pushing very extreme contradictory agendas is because they know without that, without the policing of language and pronouns and things like that, the lie can't be upheld. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing and we're likely to see more intensity along these lines in the future because of that. Yeah. 
I think you're right. You're listening to Breakpoint this week. John Stone Street here along with Trevin Wax. Come to breakpoint.org. Click on the link on the homepage that says resources mentioned on the radio and podcast. And we'll link you to the various uh, to articles and other pieces on the various stories that we've talked about this week, as well as we'll tell you how to get in touch with Trevin Wax. Or you can just go to Trevin Wax. Was it org or Trevin Wax dot com? Which one was it? Dot com. Dot com. Trevin Wax dot com. We'll stay with us. We'll be right back. You can learn more about Breakpoint and the Colson Center for Christian Worldview when you visit Breakpoint.org. That's Breakpoint.org. Back on Breakpoint this week, John Stone Street here along with Trevin Wax. Trevin's been great to have you join us. We've got just a few minutes left. Two stories uh, that I want to get to, uh, both having to do with women, both starting with the letter A. Probably never been done uh, back-to-back in history, so we're going to do it. Ozzy Abibi and Alyssa Milano. Uh, let's start with Alyssa Milano so we can end on a high note. Uh, Alyssa Milano, of course, uh, an actress. We mentioned her name earlier in the program, known for her role on shows like Who's the Boss and Charmed. Hasn't really been in anything in recent memory, at least not in my recent memory. Uh, But she um, started a Twitter campaign uh, last week, and it it was one of those kind of too-good-to-be-true moments, I think, for some of us, uh, where she basically, she called on women until, in light of the Georgia heartbeat bill, and I think she doubled down during the week, uh, but to withhold intimate relations uh, from their uh, men to show who holds the reproductive power and um, the number of pro-lifers saying wait a minute a pro-choicer calling for abstinence count me in you know it was uh it, it was some it, it was amusing if we weren't dealing with such kind of <laughs> such a grave topic yeah it was basically we're gonna we're gonna boycott unless it's with a man that you want to have a baby which which i yes thought, yes yeah that <laughs> yes. is exactly what would uh, 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 be good for the world. But um, of course, it shows the, doesn't it show the massive difference in worldview that this is seen as something so crazy that she would throw it out there. And at the same time, those of us who, who, who say, yeah, actually this is what, what, what sexual relationship is for, for, you know, the, uh, in, in the covenant of marriage to toward procreation, it's just hilarious. Well, it was it was great. And then she got pushback because she was suggesting that, you know, it only applied to cis women, trans women, you know, don't have the threat of getting pregnant. So what about them? And and you just kind of look at this and go, this is kind of a case in point of uh, of kind of everything that we've been talking about. But that's probably just you and me mansplaining. So let's move on to Ozzy Abibi. Um, Ozzy Abibi, we have talked about here on the program uh, for uh, really a couple years. Her saga goes back eight years now where she was uh, accused of blasphemy in Pakistan, uh, held on death row, was acquitted. And we were looking at it. I, I mean, this goes back to when Ed Stetzer was uh, my co-host. Warren and I have talked about it as well, waiting for some Western nations to figure out this uh, asylum so she could get out of there. Because right. as we said, her life was no less in danger having been acquitted of blasphemy than it was being accused of blasphemy. And um, we were wondered, and we, we'll say it again, where was the U.S.? Why didn't the U.S. even offer asylum to Ozzy Abibi? We have a president who's tough on immigration. A lot of people agree. I tend to agree in, at some level, but I also think that there have been promises made to persecuted Christian minorities by this administration that haven't been upheld. And if you want to show that you're, you're uh, you know, uh, on, on a kind of a, uh, a, a consistent vision of immigration and also upholding kind of the ideals of what made America uh, the sort of place that it was. This was a no-brainer. Offer asylum to Ozzy Abibi. It took a lot of time, but pleased to announce Ozzy Abibi has made her way to Canada, and uh, she is now finally free. Praise God. Yes, I was really encouraged to, to see the outcome of this, and, and glad that she glad that she didn't uh, have to, to face the death penalty uh, for these charges that were that were leveled against her. But you know, one of the things we've got to deal with, John, when we talk about um, uh, asylum or immigration or just a right now the a consistent vision of human dignity and human flourishing across the board is something that, regardless of party or worldview, we have to we as Christians are called to be consistent witnesses. Uh, even if our our governments or our elected representatives are not, and so that's one of the 
the things I hope that we'll take away from this is that um, uh, as Christians, we are called to to witness to the the dignity of of all human life in in that not simply to to follow political narratives or to uh, to you know be so partisan that we uh, were to compromise ourselves. Uh, there will be times and we'll have to stand against even our own parties for the good of our parties and for the good of uh, our world. That's one of the things that we have to have as Christians, the posture and the ability to be able to do, to be, uh, to keep that prophetic voice. Yeah, well, I appreciate your voice. I appreciate you joining us and sitting in this week. Hope to have you back sometime soon to talk about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview. Trevin, really appreciate the work that you do at the Gospel Coalition at, uh, and at Lifeway and all the other places where you write. Check out, uh, we, last year we did a, 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 we told everybody that we could about the Worldview Study Bible. It's a terrific study Bible with a collection of essays. I contributed to it. Trevin Wax was an editor along with our friend David Dockery uh, from Trinity. Make sure you check that out. We'll put a link at breakpoint.org. And follow Trevin on Twitter. Find him at uh, trevinwax.com. Uh, and again, come to breakpoint.org. Click on the link there on the homepage that says resources mentioned on the radio and podcast. And we'll link you to the various uh, articles about the stories that we talked about this week. And by the way, don't forget or don't miss the fact that if you're not able to join us this weekend in Washington, D.C., you can actually go to breakpoint.org and sign up to watch the live stream and you're not going to miss it talk about a woman who's worthy of celebration on saturday night we'll be giving the wilberforce award to mama maggie gobrin uh who's known as the mother Teresa of uh, of of cairo uh has started over a hundred schools uh helping um garbage children uh, let me say that again has started over a hundred schools helping children and family who basically live in the garbage slums there in Cairo, Egypt. Again, go to breakpoint.org and you can watch the entire live stream of the Wilberforce weekend this weekend. Trevin, great to have you and everybody else. Thanks for joining us. Join us next time on Breakpoint This Week.